Thank you. All right, I see some faces that I know, and actually faces from Columbia and as a student. That's really incredible. Um, flash in the past. Um, so let's see. So I hope to kind of walk us through a little bit of what RBI is, or the Racism and Bias Initiative uh, is. We'll talk a little bit about the strategy, the structure, the process map for transformational change. So kind of give like big picture. And then delve a little bit deeper and focusing on identifying um, teaching and learning models or practices that are aligned with uh, the vision, and I'll get to that, of the Racism and Bias Initiative. So I know that not all of you uh, teach, and so some of these uh, practices can be transferable, and so I hope to meet all of our needs collectively, and so, but it's from a teaching perspective. All right. So when thinking, before I jump into like what is RBI, um, again, that's Racism and Bias Initiative. I'm just going to use it, the short acronym, RBI. Uh, what happens when we're faced with like wicked questions that we don't necessarily know what the answers are? What about the lack of agreement about how we're going to approach something? Or uh, paradoxical issues, adaptive challenges, which means that you think that you know the answer and you implement something, but then human behavior or something happens and adapts to something else and it's completely not what you expected. What about problems with unknown solutions? So maybe we think that we know what the solutions are, but really when we come down to it, or maybe a couple weeks down the line, we're like, or months down the line, or years down the line, we realize that maybe we didn't have the right solution, or maybe we don't even know how to address it or approach it because it just seems so big, or it's, it's the system. I don't know what to do with the system, right? Um, all right, but the real question driving RBI is, what needs to change in order for us to become, uh, for us to provide healthcare and education that is free of racism and bias, and how do we get there? And that's one of the questions that the Guiding Coalition, and I'll talk about this in a second, or people who are involved in the initiative are really going to start exploring and understanding because this is not an approach where we sit in a room with leadership and we make decisions about what initiatives to roll out, right? And I'll talk a little bit about that. But we know that it's imperative and we need to commit at this very point in time. I am not going to go over all of the data that I hope that we all know about uh, health disparities, uh, outcomes for students, outcomes for patients. Uh, uh, the list goes on and on. If you want a comprehensive list, I encourage you to go to Change Now. That's a little plug of one of our websites. Um, but it really is the time is now uh, to really think about how do we dismantle racism and how can we make a commitment to that and actively do that. Also, it's an ethical Im uh, imperative. We know that, especially in academic institutions, specifically medical education, we really do need to start having potentially interdisciplinary teaching or competencies or critical aspects in order to understand how to deconstruct race and racism, right? And this isn't necessarily coming from the standpoint of it's just we should do it because it's a good thing. Students are also coming in and saying, I know how to do this from my undergrad, or I maybe understand some of these concepts, and I really want to think from a systemic level or a, or a larger level, how do I then address health disparities? Or how do I think about moving beyond just documenting uh, you know, the data, but how do I then make some changes? Or how do I become an advocate? How do I then make some changes related to addressing or dismantling uh, racism and bias? Um, and then one of, I think one of the interesting points, and we'll talk about this, is how can we be the change or how can we level, leverage our <laughs> positions of power and contribute uh, through these positions of power through that. So the Racism and Bias Initiative, it's a Change Now initiative. If you haven't gone to the site, please do. How, just by a raise of hands, how many people know about Racism and Bias Initiative or have gone to the site, have been to some of either the town hall or other things. Raise it high, if you know. All right, so a lot of you. That's great. The initiative really is a, is a result or a re in response to a lot of the students uh, who advocated and started to talk about what is the educational foundation related to racism and bias, and how do we then build those skills or competencies in order to challenge um, racism? Um, and explicitly address or undo racism. And so that really was part of this initiative that was launched in 2015. 
Um, and again, if you want to see all of the different actions or uh, things that have been done since then, I definitely encourage you. We have a great blog post there. Um, but I think what's important to at least wrap our minds around and think about where we're at now in terms of the initiative is I think this is a really great model. It's called the iceberg model. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, but a lot of the, either the responses to um, all, the responses to addressing racism and bias really has been focusing on how can we address particular events or what's happening within our learning environments? How can we address that? And that is uh, addressing an event or an issue. And that is from a reactive standpoint. Of course, that always has to happen, right? Either something happens or it's identified. OK, let's go and figure out if we can uh, implement an intervention or some type of response to either something that was driven, that was identified by students or maybe faculty or maybe staff. Um, and that is really uh, a reactive response, right? Um, and then maybe over time, we start to begin to see patterns in our learning environments or medical education here and saying like, OK, so these are some of the patterns that are going on. So let's actually anticipate this. And when we anticipate it, then maybe we can design uh, systemic structures, uh, for instance, trainings or things that we're going to roll out, mandate, or for instance, undoing racism, which was an initiative, or other initiatives that address more of uh, the systemic structures. But what happens when you need to delve a little bit deeper, right? Where you're really thinking about transforming the climate and culture, right? And so that's really getting into like, what are the assumptions, the beliefs, the values that is underpinning or holding up either students or staff or people experiencing racism in our environment? Or uh, what are some of the mental models related to how we do our work that is reinforcing it? Also, the cultural and institutional values. So it's not only the mental models within, that is held within an individual, but where are the core beliefs and values within the institution? Um, and, how, and how does that impact the worldview? Not only kind of how we see each other in a space, but then also more globally as well. So where we're at right now with the initiative is really thinking about the next phase, um, is thinking about how can we target uh, more transformation or transformational change on the lower end. So if we're going to delve deeper in the iceberg, what are some of the mechanisms or what kind of structure do we need in order to do that? So let me actually go to the vision of the initiative. So the vision is to become a health system and health profession school with the most diverse workforce providing health care and education that is free of racism and bias. All right, so this is a vision, right? It uh, is supposed to be long-reaching. We definitely want, you know, it provides a picture of kind of where we want to be at. We also broke that down in terms of multiple levels, right? So what does that vision look like on a system level or related to the school? So it's to transform the school from the current state the one that it active, uh, to one that identifies and explicitly addresses forms of racism and bias, centers racial justice, health equity, and underrepresented voices and experiences. And I'm going to talk a little bit more actually about the individual level, which is next. So not only are we talking about a system or an institution, but we also need to talk about an individual. What does it mean for the individual? And so this is really an increased adoption of the use of anti-racist approaches, which we're going to go over today, and also racial justice lenses, anti-bias mindsets, behaviors and practices, education, training, and health settings. So I think it's important, and we'll talk about why it is important to have an individual vision related to the bigger vision, but then also related to systems. All right. All of this is rooted within a methodology that is called change management. So our, when we talk about uh, the type of change that we want to see, if we want to get deeper into the iceberg, we are talking about transformational change, which is very, very different than developmental change, which is really just looking at what can we change or improve something now. And so we don't want to just make improvements. In fact, we want transformational change where there is a profound, fundamental, and irreversible change. Right? So if we want to address racism and bias, it's not just a quick fix or a change. And that's why transformational change is very tricky and really difficult, because you're going down to those mental models. You're going down to the cultural and values. Right? Um, and, you want to, and you want it to be irreversible. It's not like we're like going to say, OK, for the next five years, it's great. Let's be anti-racist. And then, then let's go back and not be anymore. Right? And so we do <laughs> want to sustain it. It's also shifting the culture of an organization, and that's where change management methodology, and I'll talk a little bit about that, 
And if you're really interested in it, please email me because I think it, it, is a, it can be applied to anything. Um, and it's really great. Uh, resulting from change, um, again, we're focusing on those underlying structures, those mental models related to that iceberg that I just showed. All right. So when we talk about change management, we talk about the people side of change often. And what that means is often when we think about changing something, we focus a lot on what is changing. Either, especially if we work where it's like product heavy, heavy or outcome uh, driven, which is the idea that, oh, if we, what's going to change? Well, we're going to develop a training. OK, great. We're going to develop a training. That's what's going to change. And we're going to change behavior through that training, right? Often we don't necessarily consider how people engage, prepare, support, and adopt that change, right? So before even a training happens, do we think about who the people are, what needs to happen in order for that training to be adopted? Because we all know, especially with adult learners, that it's not like you just tell somebody to do something and all of a sudden they go and they change, right? We know that that doesn't work. If that works, we probably all wouldn't have jobs. Um, and so it's really important to understand the people side because organizations, don't change, people change, right? And if you're not intentionally thinking about how you treat the people side of it, then you're missing out on a really big component. And often, that's when certain change often fails, because we're focusing on the content or what needs to change, the product, the output, and not necessarily on the people side. With the people side, you have to then also consider the process. So how do we design, develop, and deliver the change? Is there, and there is a methodology to start thinking about how do you deliver it? Is it that you just do a one-time, hey guys, it's time to change, or is it more structured and, and systematic, right? And start thinking about what kind of structure do you then need in order for this process to effectively happen? And I think what's really important here is if we're talking about culture shift or thinking about changing or becoming anti-racist, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, but we're thinking about undoing racism or thinking about addressing racism and bias in an institution, we really need to start thinking about the process in which we go about doing that and the care in which we do that and what that means um, for the initiative itself. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so that leads us to the structure of the initiative. And so, again, this helps reinforce uh, the process. Um, so you can approach change a couple different ways. Either the leadership team can sit in a room and say, okay, we're going to roll out these initiatives. This is our expectations. Let's plan for the rollout of it. Let's effectively communicate it. And let's then a very like, top-down approach. You also have choices, right? And if we're thinking about disrupting or dismantling or thinking about power structures, which is important when addressing racism and bias, is there another structure that we can implement on top of and still have a leadership team play a particular role during change, but can we then have a different structure in order to support this transformational change? And so based on the literature um, and research, um, that one of the structures that we fell on is this idea of a guiding coalition. And so the guiding coalition is made up of diverse groups of people throughout the school. Um, actually, by a raise of hands, how many people in the room are on the guiding coalition? Raise them high. All right. So we have a guiding coalition, um, which has six spheres or areas um, or functional areas that we are focusing on within the school. And what's interesting here is uh, we meet monthly, and we spend a lot of time, and we will be spending a lot of time. We've only met once so far. Um, but we're going to spend a lot of time through interactive exercises to really start to explore how do we identify what's changing, what needs to change, which is the content, and the people side, and then what's the process that we're going to go through this throughout the year. And then moving forward, how do we then course correct and think about how we can do this change more long term, right? Um, and so this is a group of people that are made up of leadership, students, uh, other staff members, uh, other stakeholders who are at the table. And so, it, and so part of that is really saying that we won't be able to identify what needs to change or the change targets without having multiple people who are at the table. Um, this guiding coalition is also supported by the change management resource team. And so we've had a lot of people internally who were trained. We spend a lot of time 
uh, thinking about how do we re, uh, help support the methodology? What kind of tools do we need? What kind of information do we need to disseminate to people in the leadership team or in ODI, CMCA, or the Guiding Coalition and start thinking about how do we then support the people side, right, of, of the change? And what kind of tools can we develop? <clears throat> what communications are we sending? Um, also, the leadership team has a particular role uh, around change sponsors. So we also know that it's really important to have a leadership team who is saying, uh, I support this change, and this is what we're contributing and supporting and sponsoring this change. And so that still is an important piece, but it's not the only piece, right? Um, and then we have diversity and inclusion who are providing additional supports around what other materials uh, in order or tools and other supportive materials that can help support all of us to do the work. All right. So in terms of a timeline and where we're at and what's coming next, um, so, uh, so we're currently right now we're in phase two, which is creating a climate for change. And maybe you've seen some of the communications or maybe you've been part of some of the, the things that we've rolled out. Um, but it really, and the main focus of this time was to start creating the guiding coalition and start forming uh, that group and start to think about how can we work collectively together because we do have a very diverse group. Um, and then we're moving into engaging and enabling, uh, and so that is a process that we are doing. And so in June, I'm happy to report, and we'll also be sending out an email that we'll be engaging other folks outside, well, within the school, but outside of the guiding coalition in order to help identify and elicit information about what needs to change in order uh, for um, you know, the guiding question. So what needs to change related to providing uh, education and healthcare that is free of racism and bias, right? Uh, and then we'll start implementing some of the change targets or some of the things that have been identified. Then we're moving to correcting the course and planning, so a little bit more planning. So I wanted to get back to this point because I think it's important and I think it helps uh, frame kind of the bigger portion of this talk, which is really on uh, organizations don't change, but people do. Right? And so what does that mean for all of us, uh, especially if it uh, as it relates to the vision related to the individual? Right? So we have a choice. Right? Our individual actions can cumulatively serve to maintain existing forms of inequality, or they can serve to dismantle systems of oppression. And so we do have a choice of how we approach the work. Uh, so I'm going to move into talking a little bit about anti-racism and what that means and what are the approaches or the practices and what does that mean for all of us. But before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that I think it's important that anti-racism is building on the diversity and multiculturalism, right? And I think that this is an important aspect that I think is important because part of some of the, uh, the critical analysis or critique about just approaching it from diversity or multicultural standpoint is are we naming <coughs> racism if we just focus on diversity or multiculturalism, multiculturalism? And are we then unknowingly kind of reinforcing the idea of that if we don't necessarily name racism, are we then intentionally not necessarily addressing racism? So when we talk about anti-racism, I think that what's important to acknowledge is that we are addressing racism. We are actively, and there's an action component or piece that's in there. And so if you just talk about diversity as, as kind of like globally or, or largely, it doesn't necessarily call into question what then happens with when we talk about racism, right? Um, and so I know, uh, so some of the critiques are on, for instance, thinking about like cultural competencies, right? Building cultural competencies. Uh, moving to a place of then cultural responsiveness. So it's not just necessarily being competent, but then you have to be responsive mm -hmm. to other cultures, right? But there is a notion, right, that, that, the, that the culture or differences in culture is the primary uh, event there, right? And it's, it's multiculturalism is that there's multiple cultures and then diversity in order to hold that up. But what happens then when we say, in fact, it's not necessarily an equal playing field. Can we build critical consciousness in order to think about how do we move to a place of addressing racism in particular? So I do want to say this, that. I'll get back to that. So anti-racism isn't a bad word, right? And I know that some 
people, especially when I go into spaces and I'm like, all right, let's talk about anti-racism. People are like, whoa, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Actually, it's anti and racism. What does that really mean? And so I, I wanted to put this kind of loose definition up, and there's multiple definitions, and I want to acknowledge that. But it's really a focus and sustained action that reduces power differentials and eliminates racism. It is targeted, right? And I think that that is the key. It is targeted, it is focused, it is an action. So everything that I'm going to be talking about moving forward is very action-oriented. It's what can you do in spaces. It isn't necessarily um, also isolated to a particular place, right? And so I want to also acknowledge this, that it is an active way of seeing and being in all of the world. It's not just like when I go into a classroom that I'm going to be kind of um, employ my anti-racist strategies during the class and then like when I walk out and then interact with staff or others, I'm then going to like not do that, right? And so I think it's important to, to see this as it is embedded or baked in, as Angel and folks say, you know, like baked into uh, this idea of like who, how we see and be. Um, so just by a raise of hand, talk about seeing and being. Do you aim to foster learning environments, or maybe we can apply this to like relationships with staff or um, work environments uh, that challenge each student or staff to achieve academically or their job at high levels? Just by a raise of hand, how many people do this or would like to do this, aspire to do this, or value this? Um, want all students and staff to thrive in our institutions. Believe in engaging the whole student or person in teaching and learning process or at their job. Value the culture and global differences that students bring or staff bring to the educational experience or maybe their work. Value the intellectual and social developments of all students. All right. We're all aligned with anti-racist anti <laughs> principles and practices and, and, and really the underpinning of it, right? All right, so I wanted to move into thinking about kind of the shift, right? So some of the things are shifting our thinking, are shifting, or thinking about shifting our thinking or frame around racism. So on one hand, if we have a belief that racism about, is about individual attitudes, which means that if, if I uh, don't have any racist intentions, therefore I'm not racist and I don't participate in racism. So if we believe that, the, that racism is about the individual or individual attitudes, that's one kind of way of thinking about racism. Um, also, if we generally talk about race, as discrete categories without a discussion of racism, uh, racism, right? So race and racism, then we're overlooking issues of systemic and institutional racism. So if we're not looking at systemic and institutional racism, are we then just focusing on the individual or just focusing on the categories? I think that's the most important part here. Do we only engage in isolated conversations about racism? when there isn't a long-term intentional way of authentically talking about racism throughout. So often this looks like when they, maybe during a certain event or maybe you're teaching a particular content, you're like, oh, I think race applies to this. And so let's just talk about race in this very discreet way opposed to saying, let me actually think about over the course or over time, where are the points in which we will talk about all forms of, of racism, not just individual level, interpersonal, internalized, and also systemic. Uh, comfort using stereotypes without question or critical analysis. And I think that this is an important piece because this is saying, okay, so let's use some of the stereotypes without having that critical analysis and looking at what does that mean then for those stereotypes. So what happens if we apply anti-racism or, or that particular shift or lens? Um, so we understand racism operates on personal, ideological, and institutional levels, so it's multiple levels. Um, we discuss racism as systemic uh, phenomenon embedded in American society and history so that there's a historical component, which is important. Uh, we recognize nor normalization and um, legitimization of an array of dynamics. So again, like what is normal? What is perceived as normal? <laughs> 
um, both in history and culture and institutions, maybe interpersonal uh, relationships, like what is normal, like how do we engage each other. Um, also understanding that there's a cumulative effect and chronic outcomes related associated with uh, experiencing racism, right, or in uh, the environment. Also recognize power and privilege, and we'll talk a little bit about that briefly. I'm so not used to lecturing always. I just keep going back and I'm like, okay, let's do an exercise now. Like, I just like, this is so bizarre. Okay, uh, next time it will be interactive, I swear. So let's see how this works in action, right? I always like to say, like, if I gave you that uh, to go with, I'm sure a lot of you walk away and say, well, wait a minute, okay, then how do you actually do it? So I like to give an action piece. So one, so how could you do or think about or do or reinforce this shift or be able to do the shift within yourself? One, building knowledge. We, you know, we know this, right? Um, understanding the historical and present context of racism, um, and also thinking about medical racism, right? I think that's a really important piece. Um, and seeking out that information, but then also thinking about your self-awareness and reflection. It always starts with I, or with me. Like, what are some? What's your story? Um, and recognizing your own racial identity in multifaceted ways that it evolves over time. So maybe who I identified as at one point, um, my identities, they can change and there's a formation over time. Uh, and, I, and I think that that is also responsive to also what's happening socially, right? Sometimes identities change because also the world is changing, right? And so it's, I think it's important. It, doesn't, it means that it's not just an answer that you give today but it's an ongoing conversation that you can have. Um, also, I have a self-assessment tool for those who um, want to know what their story is. Also, a comfort with the concept of privilege and internalization. And I think that this is an important piece because I think with the self-awareness and reflection, how comfortable are you with the idea of privilege? How comfortable are you in understanding or looking at the comprehensive ways in which constructs like race, class, gender, sexuality, disability intersect and reinforce kind of the cultural norms or not, right? And I think the really good kind of like barometer of this is like how comfortable are you is like to start thinking about your behavior. Like even right now, like check in. What are you feeling? I've said a lot of terms that I know that people might have feelings about, right? What are those feelings? Where do they come from? Start, I think, asking questions of yourself, like, oh, when Leona just said anti-racist, I inside was like freaking out because it's like a term that I don't feel comfortable with. And I think that that uh, is important to start thinking about, or maybe you, you love the term and you wanna know more about it and how to do it, right? But it's a doing a quick check-in and trying to figure out kind of where, the, where your reactions or responses coming from. Um, so now we're getting to like pedagogical design or different strategies. Sorry. So this is if you're designing a course or if you're even thinking about engaging any kind of like content that you're disseminating to another person. So if you're a staff, either working with, with people, students, thinking about <clears throat> how can you find a strategy to introduce race issues throughout the course, right? Again, this isn't like a one-time uh, kind of like, let's just say it once and then let's hope that that's enough, right? Like, what is the sustained strategy of thinking about how to embed this? Also, what about designing the learning process to examine race and racism? How do you do that, right? And I think that there are, one, there are wonderful resources, and actually I'm going to tell you about an opportunity a little bit later, but really thinking about how do you do that and, and plan for that, of course. I think that this is an important piece and also talking about the ongoing uh, process, but how do you further develop uh, racial identity when acquiring new knowledge? So for instance, you can, you can then teach a concept now, have people go out in the world and come back and reflect and to talk about kind of what that experience is. And it also um, reinforces this idea that your identity or how you see yourself in the world uh, can be evolving and it evolves with experiences. And so being a student and having experiences then you can use that as an opportunity to engage in those type of conversations, which are ongoing. What about instruction? So if you approach instruction where you think of it as a 
as banking education. So what that means is, is that you view the student right, as a container in which that you then disseminate or give information to, or where you deposit the knowledge, opposed to understanding that the student comes with lived experiences and other forms of being able to teach you something or you can teach them something, right? Um, so the teacher teaches and the students are taught. Um, there's an instructor, so is almost always responsible for the content so that there isn't this exchange of content. It's lecture style. Um, you also cultivate learning spaces that are polite, maybe, or, don't, or you don't necessarily want to engage in difficult conversations. And you, so you stick uh, maybe really closely to the content and don't necessarily have room or give room or opportunity or instruction to deviate from that. That's one way of like kind of creating a container where you're going through just that particular piece of content. Um, or you believe in neutrality and objectivity are realistic and attainable. So for instance, thinking about like color blindness, like we're all equal, or I don't see color, um, right? And so I think that that could be one interpretation that we can approach learning environments, right? This idea that all students who come here all come with a particular background or understanding and or that I believe that we're all neutral here, or we're all here to learn, or we're all here to be doctors, or we're all here to be in medical education, or we're all coming, you know, kind of like these like really big, we're all kind of like neutral in this game, um, which is deeply embedded in our, in our thinking. Um, so challenging that by, what if there's a mutual dialogue? So it's not just that I see the student as a, as a, as a that I'm banking the information, but in fact, that there's, a, there's a, there could be a mutual dialogue between students or the person who is uh, facilitating or teaching, right? Um, or this could be staff with other people as well. Um, also, students are encouraged to bring their critical lens to their studies, weigh in for new information against their own experiences, right? And so it's acknowledging that students, and especially adult learners, come with a wealth of information. From student learning principles, we know that you often have to start with what the person is bringing in, right? And that's how you build the knowledge and scaffold it. That it isn't just that, that people are, are waiting for the information and then all of a sudden they make the change in their behavior, but in fact eliciting more information so that they can then sink that knowledge into something that they personally experience is where you start to see either change or real knowledge and growth. <coughs> Um, also have an opportunity to question the educator or the course material, right? So if you present some material that maybe you didn't even realize was um, not politicized or maybe you didn't even realize would trigger some students in the room, is there an opportunity to bring that up and to discuss that within the class, right? Um, and this is aligned with like student-centered learning, of course. Class instruction moves from students beyond their comfort zone. Um, so this is really challenging their own wor world view. And it believes that learning occurs when people are most uncomfortable. So really, this is really challenges the idea that we all have learning edges and that when we get outside of our comfort zone is really when the learning happens. We can think about this also in our own lives. Often, some of the most challenging times uh, produce some of the most amazing learning opportunities in life. All right, in action. So I know this is text heavy. I normally don't do this, but I, I will send this out to everybody so you can have this. I know a lot of people are like, they wanted additional information about like how to do it. OK, so what if you have a variety of materials or learning opportunities or assignments um, that intentionally seek to identify and challenge um, the systems that maintain power. So how would you go about doing that, right? And this is where the critical consciousness piece really comes into play. So you can design activities where students are, have an opportunity to self-reflect, right? Um, so again, this is bringing in their own lived experience or their consciousness and, and really challenging because maybe what they believe or perceive to be true or normal or right Maybe there's an opportunity within the class to really explore that piece. And, and then you can learn from narratives. Narratives are a really good opportunity to start thinking about 
how do you use narratives and also other narratives that are not the dominant uh, narrative, right? How can you provide some type of um, diversity within like the voices or lived experiences, especially if you don't necessarily have it within the classroom, but then also the important piece of inc inc incorporating that into that as well. Engage in critical thinking. You can use mapping techniques. You could potentially analyze text three different ways. I first analyze the text as it relates to um, other text. I can then analyze the text as it relates to me as a person. I can analyze the text as it relates to other people within the class. So really thinking about the different dynamics of utilizing a particular text as not just being one kind of voice, but a voice related to my own experience, but then a voice that that's, uh, could be you know, multiple dimension. Um, so one of, I found this really interesting article related to um, using case base or case examples often are how, or using critical consciousness or critical thinking on some of the case examples. And so normally when case examples are developed, there is one outcome that you are looking for. What happens if you develop case examples where there's multiple outcomes, right? Potentially that could happen. And then using that as an opportunity for students to explore and to talk about and then add and reflect on it and how that relates to themselves, but then also the multiple examples or opportunities within that case. Interviewing or engaging folks, um, engaging in small group exercises. I always like to say small group is really great, but I like to say always do think, pair, share. And the reason why I say that is because thinking allows people to first focus on themselves first. Often if you say get into small groups, we automatically start to go to like developing that group and not necessarily everybody will have a voice. So if everybody comes to that small group with already thinking about what they're thinking of, what they're self-reflecting, then they're coming to the group with at least some content and knowledge. Then you can pair up and share, or maybe you can then go like the twos, the, the quads, and whatever. So like the two people can then link up with other two people, and then you can like build snowball out of that. It's a really great technique. Also, learning conversations or circles, fishbowl activity. Has anyone done a fishbowl before? What do you have? And so fishbowl is really great. You can have a discussion or a dialogue within a smaller circle, and then you have people who are sitting outside the circle observing what's happening within the circle, right? And by the way, I have write-ups on, I can share this. Round robin, again, I think this is really important. Often in classrooms, unknowingly, uh, or knowingly, uh, some of the same students speak or some of the same people in meetings speak. Um, if you want to start thinking about how do we get everybody's voice, you can just have a round robin, which everybody then can, can contribute. I think, again, this is, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, it's an important aspect to start thinking about how can, if you really want to address the whole student or all the students in your class, what kind of structures are you setting in place that enable that to happen? All right, incorporate materials or multimedia that breaks away from the dominant discourse. I can't even tell you how many things are now online that you can use to provide alternatives to what could be a dominant discourse, and we'll t we could talk about that uh, offline. <laughs> so creating a container. If you expect or want to kind of focus on all of the instructional strategies that we were talking about, how do you then do that? And so part of that is to create a container to allow for either norms or agreements within the class, and now, or a class or group. Um, and so I think this is really powerful. I think it's hard to expect anyone, whether it's students or whoever, to participate and bring their full selves and be able to understand um, how to do that without expectations that this space or this class or this group will in fact be, that is an expectation or a norm that you want. Or even having critical consciousness. Is that an expectation? Or having critical thinking employed. Like, is that an expectation that you would have? And if so, putting that up front and having that as being framing the class or the time that you're spending together, I think, can be really an important tool of creating that container and expectation. Also dismantling the idea that, that there's just one voice or there is, which is a dominant narrative voice, uh, which can consume or uh, impact kind of that container if you don't necessarily intentionally try to set it up so it doesn't do that. Um, 
self-reflection, critical consciousness, of course. Um, embrace marginalized voices. So again, this could be a really simple strategy. This doesn't necessarily create, you know, it could be as simple as asking for different opinions. Does anybody have a different opinion here? Are there other perspectives that we haven't taken into consideration? Are there people you know, who haven't shared what they feel? So it could be just as simple as that, all the way down to really presenting and centering marginalized voices by either using text or other materials or uh, individuals within the class. Um, and so that's an important piece. Also disrupting traditional dichotomous thinking. I know this is really, really, really hard. So what keeps us entrenched in the us, them, or the white other, oppressed, oppressor, good, bad, binaries, this idea that there's a good and a bad, part of doing anti-racism approach is to disrupt this thinking, right? Because this reinforces this idea that there is that binary, right? So some of the things that you can do is that you can start listening for it. I always like to say before you jump in and try to make any changes, just start identifying and recognizing it within the room. So this is often what happens when there's complex issues and people reduce it down to something that is binary. Right? We can say, hey, <laughs> is it a little bit more complex? I would like to hear other perspectives. Right? I can't even tell this particular, you know, this is so deeply embedded in how we teach and educate in our language that even just being aware of it will start shifting uh, the, the class or groups as well. So this could be um, asking for alternatives, challenging this binary, um, but definitely disrupting it. And that's, that's the action piece of anti-racism approaches, like disrupting it. Um, also understand the uh, discomfort uh, is the root of growth and learning. Again, we talked about that before. You may have to then build your um, political um, analysis of racism and oppression. Um, again, this is the learning piece that I think is important. The last one, I just wanted to focus on viewpoints really quickly. This is really focusing on uh, how we viewpoint related to like health or thinking about individuals uh, or individualism, right? Meritocracy as well. So I will send this out, and I, I really want to open up space, but do we see health conditions as others? And I think that this is an interesting piece, even othered outside of the class. So for instance, it's not happening within the class, but it's happening like outside in the world and not necessarily also just here in a depoliticized way. So it just is a condition opposed to there being something that's a little bit more broader and more complex. Um, discourse of individualism, right? A set of ideas, words, symbols, metaphors, um, where there's a storyline or narrative of that it's an individual opposed to systemic or systems of oppression. Uh, competition, more highly valued than cooperation. So there's very often not skills to cooperate. That's an interesting one that I think is probably way more prevalent than we think. And if we think about opportunities where we're learning in our spaces, are we really learning to be cooperative? Or are we learning to be um, competitive and individualistic and like moving it forward? That there's a level playing field and we all have equal opportunities. So the shift would be that we critically reflect on the ways in which um, oppression and power play out in our, in our learning environments or in our environments. We value. Um, Make visible and not ignore the systems of oppression. So part of that action piece of anti-racism is making visible. Um, examine issues from multiple perspectives, not just one perspective, so that you start to see, again, the various voices. What does it look in action? Challenging what's normal. Can we do that? How can we do that through text or through, through other things? And then structural competency or different ways of looking at social, economic, legal, cultural structures that impact health, so it not just being one uh, focusing on, on, on one, but really looking at the system and the dynamic system. So there's examples there. I got to it. <laughs> I just want to do this shameless plug because I know that people are going to have to go soon. We are going to start, it's called a community of practice. Starting in July, I'm going to be sending out. So if you're interested in these approaches or start wanting to think about and learning from each other, 
we can do that, and so I'll have this up later. Yes? So many of these things you have talked about are at the conscious level. Mm -hmm. We know that racism is deeply unconscious as well. Mm -hmm. The anti-gender issue, the homophobia issue. Mm -hmm. These are not all at the surface level that I can easily get to. Yep. I've been indoctrinated mm -hmm. against women, blacks, mm -hmm. gay, lesbians. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there is a way to get deeper within the problem than these conscious level efforts that you've described. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think it, it's multi-pronged. So I do think that I think you can make what's unconscious conscious by learning and doing some self-reflection as well. I think that's a huge piece of this. You starting with self, right? So I, I, I would challenge the notion that just because we have been indoctrinated doesn't necessarily mean that that can change, that, that it won't change. I think it can it, change. It can change, but it has yes. to be addressed as something you may not be aware of. Correct. Or its roots. Right. But I do think with looking at doing some self-reflection, some knowledge building, also sitting with other folks that maybe feel very similarly to you and then maybe not similarly to you with different lived experiences, I think is really important. I think that there are spaces or learning spaces that people can create in order to help make the, in the invisible visible. I feel like what you're asking me is actually to be anti-racist, right? Is to say, how can I, it is though, right? Because it's the idea of how can I then have action to it? And what can I do for myself as an individual? But then what can I do in spaces or learning spaces or professional development spaces or other spaces where, where you can then become either knowledgeable about this and really understand where you come from as well? The, the, the personal piece is important here. Yes? I'm uh, having difficulty with the sense that discomfort is the sole basis for growth and learning. Right. Let me uh, expand. Mm -hmm. Surely there must be something to the joy of discovery and revelation. Not grown out of discomfort, but new knowledge. Right. I, 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 I'm arguing against discomfort as the universal mm -hmm. source mm -hmm. for growth and learning, because it implies more than you, I think, believe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it denies another process. Mm -hmm. So I would say this. So one, I don't think it's a or. I don't think it's dichotomous. I don't think it's one or the other. Okay. Uh, so yes. It's so in your I think when we're talking about race and racism in particular, I think it evokes discomfort to begin with. And so I think for some people, that level or feeling discomfort around learning about it, learning about it, right? Um, is seen as a negative thing and normally shuts down the conversation and the learning opportunities. So what I'm saying is if we recognize that actually holding that discomfort and understanding where that discomfort is coming from through self-reflection, through more learning opportunities, may give a ch an opportunity to really embrace and not see it as a negative thing. I don't think discomfort when you're learning is a negative thing. I think we're potentially maybe taught that. And I think that that is one of the barriers that has allowed um, uh, institutions, organizations, schools uh, to not address it because it feels uncomfortable. I understand now that it applies to ridding yourself or discovering in discomfort right. your own incorrect views of the world and individual. Right, and you still have joy. And you still have joy. We, we have all the things. Don't worry. It's not dichotomous. We still have joy. We still have, like, you know, building knowledge. We still have all of these. And I think the, the piece is just really questioning that discomfort and not having it as a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm hearing is a paradigmatic shift 
and I'm back on the slide that says creating a container. And the new challenge for all of us here, moving forward with the RBI, is how do you create a container to have these kinds of conversations and create a safe space? So safe space may mean uh, the shift for me would be uh, we're going to be just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And uncomfortable is good. But if we're going to say uncomfortable is good, the people in the room have to know it's a safe space. Can right. you comment on all yeah. that? So it's interesting because there's some literature out there that says that we need to actually stop calling it a safe space because um, not everybody will feel safe especially individuals who are most marginalized, will never feel safe in spaces, potentially, in some spaces, right? Um, so I don't also want to use extreme, so I, in some spaces. Um, so really the challenge is, is brave space. Uh, so do we create spaces where people are brave? Or, and part of creating those spaces is that container. How can we ensure that everyone has an opportunity to contribute to the class. How can we ensure that there's norms and that, for instance, people who hold positions of power, white, male, middle class, the dominant narrative doesn't necessarily hold all of the space. How can we then give voice to marginalized? So it, it's all interconnected and embedded. And I think, yes, discomfort is part of that process, especially when we're talking about like internalized, whether you are either have internalized racism, and that could go both ways. That's privilege, and that's oppression, right? Because often when we think about internalized racism, we often go to just thinking about oppression. I think it's really important to talk about privilege. And often we don't want to talk about privilege because it's way too discomfortable. So I think part of that is to say, is to recognize that some spaces will never be safe for some people, but we can create dynamics and expectations and structure and frame it so that we can try to maximize on that. And when people don't feel that they can be brave, then recorrect and be able to have that mechanism within that, that class. Because it's not static, it, it, it will change. So you do have to be adaptive to what's happening in the room. A lot of this has to be knowing what's happening in the room and then adapting to it. I also just want to say, is there any other perspectives or opinions? Because <laughs> I also want to just make a note about like, who also asked the questions. Um, is there anyone else who has any questions? So I just want to, OK. Thank you. Thank you.